let me uh, welcome uh, those folks uh, who are here uh, joining us live uh, at the uh, University of Utah S.J. Quinney College of Law for this Wallace Stegner Center uh, Green Bag uh, Lunch presentation, our final uh, Green Bag presentation of this academic year. Uh, not only do I welcome uh, the folks uh, who are present uh, joining us live, uh, we're very pleased that we're in a position to uh, offer uh, our programs live at this point in time, and we certainly look forward to being able to continue doing that uh, next year when we uh, reconvene in the fall. Uh, I'm uh, Bob Keiter, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment, again here at the University of Utah College of Law. Uh, we're uh, pleased that uh, so many of you are joining us uh, remotely. Uh, we hope we see you live uh, uh, in the fall when we reconvene. Uh, let me uh, start with the uh, acknowledgement uh, that this land uh, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Uh, a quick uh, uh, note that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we'll be uh, reconvening uh, in the fall uh, for another set of uh, noon programs along with the annual Stegner Center Symposium and Young Scholar presentation. Uh, that uh, uh, information about uh, those events will be posted uh, over the course of the summer uh, on uh, the Wallace Stegner Center website. Uh, so stay tuned to that. Uh, also, I should note uh, that if uh, any uh, of you have suggestions uh, for noon programs uh, or as a potential annual uh, uh, symposium uh, topic, uh, we're certainly uh, open to those, and they can be posted uh, through uh, the Stegner Center website. Uh, today, uh, we're going to hear about uh, the Central Wasatch Mountains uh, solutions, paralysis, uh, or a path forward. Uh, we're very pleased to be joined by uh, an extraordinarily knowledgeable uh, individual and speaker on this topic. Uh, that is uh, Ralph uh, Becker, uh, who is a University of Utah Law School graduate, as well as a graduate of the planning program at uh, the U. Uh, he currently serves as executive director of the Central Wasatch uh, Commission, uh, which is an interlocal uh, governmental entity uh, formed to protect the central Wasatch Mountains and to implement uh, the Mountain Accord Agreement. Uh, Ralph is a 48-year resident of Salt Lake City. Uh, he served two terms uh, as mayor uh, of our city. Uh, he also served in the Utah State Legislature as a member of the House of Representatives for 11 years, uh, occupying for five years the House Minority Leader uh, position. Uh, in 2015, uh, Ralph served as president of the National uh, League of Cities uh, during the course of his uh, mayoral uh, tendency. Uh, in 1985, uh, after graduating from law school uh, and working uh, for three years as state planning coordinator for uh, Governor Scott uh, Matheson, uh, Ralph co-founded and worked for 22 years at Bear West, a community resource uh, management, uh, public lands and environmental planning consulting firm. Uh, he speaks regularly, uh, both nationally and internationally, on governance, sustainability, climate change, and public lands. Uh, he's served uh, for a number of years as an adjunct professor in the university's uh, College of Architecture and Planning. Uh, his undergraduate degree is from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's going to 
talk about uh, the current issues uh, confronting uh, the central Wasatch Mountain Range uh, today. Uh, and in the course of that, uh, he is hoping uh, to encourage uh, dialogue and discussion among both our in uh, uh, in-person attendees uh, and our online attendees. I should note also that uh, uh, our online attendees can submit questions uh, through the uh, code uh, Slido uh, that is uh, noted uh, on the screen uh, here. Uh, with uh, no further ado, I'm very pleased uh, that the Stegner Center is able to host uh, today uh, former Mayor Ralph Becker and Central Wasatch Executive Director at the present time. Thank you for joining us, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob, uh, thank you so much. And to the college and folks who I know work hard to put, put this kind of a program together, uh, I want you to know that uh, those of you in the audience look OK, but the folks online are looking really good. Um, so I appreciate everybody's attendance and, and participation. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about sort of the context for uh, the, the Central Wasatch Mountains, both physically and in terms of, of governmental and, and being that we're in the law school, a bit of legal, um, and the use uh, in the Wasatch. Uh, and then I'm going to focus really most of my attention on the last uh, 10 years, what uh, at least for this talk, I've described as kind of the Mountain Accord era, which began in 2012. So uh, l let me begin by just talking a little bit about the context so that everyone's sort of on an even place in terms of, uh, in terms of these mountains. Um, we are incredibly fortunate here that these mountains are our backyards. They're the backyards for the Salt Lake and, and uh, Park City area uh, areas, um, and they are dramatic, particularly from our side of the range. They rise abruptly 7,000 feet uh, from the valley floor. Um, it is the primary watershed for both the Wasatch Front uh, and the Wasatch Back, and that's accompanied by a lot of legal protection and, and the prioritization for managing for watershed protection. Uh, the ownership is 80% public. Uh, it's 60% federal, 20% Salt Lake City, which has acquired lands for really over a century now uh, for watershed protection, and then 20% private. So it is primarily a public lands resource. Um, and these mountains are unique in this country, certainly. Um, any place that I've been in their incredible accessibility. You can get into these mountains uh, within 20 minutes from anywhere uh, and enjoy them within 20 minutes. Uh, I like to kid my good friends from Denver that Salt Lake City is what Denver pretends to be. Uh, we are truly a mountain city uh, in our access, ability to easily access and quickly access the mountains. It's also an area that uh, serves as the home for for internationally, international destination ski resorts. Um, I mean, in the top 10 ski resorts, certainly in this country, and rated consist consistently around the world. Um, it's also the home of designated wilderness areas and true wilderness. Um, another feature that I, a lot of people don't um, appreciate so much, uh, but we all do certainly locally, is the incredible visitation in these mountains. <clears throat> um, if this were a national park, if this area, 80,000 acres, was a national park, it would be the third most visited national park in the country. Actually, in looking at some statistics uh, in the last couple of days, it would actually be the second most visited. Because Zion just moved into second place ahead of Yellowstone third. Can anyone name the most visited national park? I'm sure you can. It's the Smoky Mountains, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's in incredibly well used and loved. Um, and compared to Yellowstone, which is a million acres plus, 
This is 80,000 acres. So in terms of use and intensity of use in a relatively small area, it is remarkable for its environmental values. It's still some of the most pristine and best water anywhere in the country coming out of these mountains. And for both the intensity and the range of uses in these mountains. <clears throat> it also, these mountains also have an, an incredible history. Obviously, indigenous peoples use these mountains. Um, but since 1847 and the LDS migration into this area, before it was even part of the United States, and from the very first days, uh, these mountains have been heavily used. Uh, logging uh, in the earliest days, there, was, there, were, there weren't trees in this valley. You could go to a monument on 6th East and see where there was a tree, you know, this being celebrated. Um, so, uh, there was intensive logging. Um, then there was a mining area beginning in the 1860s, 1870s, through the early part of the 20th century, and really extending into mid-century. And then the era that we're in now, which is where recreation use really dominates uh, these mountains. Any of you are interested in an incredible and detailed history, uh, there's a book called Lady in the Ore Bucket that a guy named uh, Charles Keller wrote uh, in about 2000. So let me turn a bit in terms of the decision making, uh, and I'm going to focus on the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, as I mentioned, there's intense competition for very limited terrain, uh, with a priority for watershed protection and environmental protection that everyone really acknowledges. Uh, there has been uh, some really uh, lands protection. The first wilderness in Utah was the Lone Peak Wilderness in 1978. And it was followed not that long thereafter, in 1984, by, uh, by Twin Peaks and Lone Peak wilderness areas. Um, the transportation, I'd say the other sort of dominant issues, lands and transportation in these mountains. Um, there are uh, studies going back. There's a long history of actually how people gained access to these mountains. But focusing on the last 30 years, uh, you can go back to studies in the 70s, intensively in the 80s, and right up to today um, of the transportation conditions and the, uh, and the transportation possible solutions. Uh, we all know who use these mountains that uh, we've gone from uh, easy access to congestion to gridlock on a lot of days, particularly in the winter. And that the, um, the, the challenges um, uh, haven't diminished. In fact, it's not uncommon on a winter day to have two plus hours of waiting time when it would otherwise be a 20 minute to 30 minute drive into the mountains. So with all of that as a, back, a backdrop, um, 10 years ago, um, there was an effort to change a dynamic that was, I would say, in many respects, paralysis for decades. Um, and it was, uh, the impetus for it was a proposal called Ski Link, uh, which many of you may remember. Um, uh, any of you who are here certainly will remember. It was a proposal that came out of our congressional offices, Utah Delegation Congressional Offices, sponsored by uh, Representative Bishop to sell a swath of Forest Service land to connect the Canyon Ski Resort and Solitude Ski Resort, uh, which would both provide a corridor for, uh, for ski lifts, uh, but also provide uh, for future development along that corridor. Uh, I can tell you from having been involved in that era, our congressional delegation had no idea what they were walking into, uh, and the storm fire of response and, and vitriol that, that came at them uh, that included me at the time as mayor and uh, certainly was, was part of that reaction. Uh, I learned about reading about it in the newspaper one morning um, and that there was an announcement that the bill had been introduced, it was just gonna be a hearing the next week and the bill was gonna fly through Congress. Uh, fortunately, it died a merciful or unmerciful death. Um, but it also created the impetus, the, really the catalyst for a lot of us getting together locally and going, you know what, if we don't get our act together, 
and get beyond this gridlock of decision making um, and figure out what we want to happen, others are going to be making decisions for us. Um, and a group of us came together and said, all right, let's see if we can get all of the private and public parties together and go through a process, uh, the classic process that the Stegner Center promotes a lot of consensus building um, and following kind of a, what I would call sort of a basic NEPA process um, and try to see if we can arrive at what we want to see happen and are willing to see happen uh, in these mountains. That uh, three-year effort, uh, which became to be known and labeled as uh, Mountain Accord, uh, resulted in, uh, in an agreement uh, where all of the sides, public and private, came together and signed an agreement. And uh, it was, uh, it's about 15 pages long. Um, and sort of the, the biggest pieces of it um, were that it would improve the land protections through formal federal designations, new federal designations that included uh, increased wilderness, some new wilderness, and uh, a new land designation over the public lands in this area. Um, and an, uh, a realignment of ownership through land exchanges to try to get the lands that were intensively used privately more in private hands, because it all, it's all a mishmash up there. Uh, and to get the lands that are used by the public and particularly valuable to the public in public, land, in public hands. Uh, the other side of that barbell, besides lands and resource protection, was transportation. And it came to some conclusions, but recognized that we at that time, locally, were not ready to finalize decisions about how to solve the increasing transportation challenges in the mountains. But it did say, no more cars. That is not the solution in parking. Uh, it's, so it's got to be a transit solution. And we're not going to let Guardsman's Pass get developed into a year-round road. There are a whole variety of reasons. Everyone concluded that wasn't going to work. Um, uh, but that uh, to move forward. Um, and that sort of uh, barbell or, or teeter-totter um, really is what allowed folks to accept both better protections in the Wasatch through designations and transportation solutions that would invariably increase users, um, but also solve what was a problem uh, for, uh, for so many people, even at that time uh, in the Wasatch. Um, <clears throat> it also called for some other things. I might touch on these, or we can talk about them uh, in discussion or Q&A. Um, it, it called for establishment of a new governmental entity that with the 20 plus jurisdictions in these mountains uh, and these intensely uh, competing and sometimes adversarial interests, that there needed to be a forum, both for decision making and, and to carry out this agreement. It called for the agreement to get carried out immediately, uh, recognizing, uh, those of you who have been involved in these things, that time kills all deals uh, because people change and circumstances change. Um, and then for a lot of very, I will say, specific projects. Um, in the aftermath of 2015, um, things actually moved slowly, as government and others tend to do. Um, and so there was, in some respects, kind of a hiatus of really uh, quick and, and, uh, and really strong action for a couple of years. Uh, and some of it was awaiting for the central, what became the Central Wasatch Commission to form. Uh, it got formed at the end of 2017, really started to mobilize in 2018, and uh, it really was mid-2018 before it really kind of hit the ground running. Uh, during that time, uh, legislation had been worked on. Uh, Representative Chaffetz uh, introduced legislation in Congress to implement the land designations and wilderness piece of Mountain Accord. It was very late in the congressional session, and, and uh, there was a hearing held, but too many things to get worked out before the end of that Congress. And then uh, as players changed uh, in Congress and, uh, and elsewhere, um, 
I'd say the momentum for that legislation um, got delayed and continues to be delayed. Um, on the transportation side, rather than sort of pick up where Mountain Accord left off and say, okay, let's focus in on what the transit solutions are <clears throat> and other solutions that are demand management type solutions like tolling, uh, they decided to do a study and spent a million dollars on a one year plus study and produced a lot of really good information, but it did not, uh, I say, take advantage of the momentum of Mountain Accord to bring people together and to start to jointly consider what the options were for solving transportation problems. Um, so, uh, so time passed and, uh, and that, I think, hurt the ability to complete uh, the Mountain Accord Agreement. Um, so let me talk a bit about this era that we're in now, which began, I'd say, in 2018 with the Central Wasatch Commission. Um, it is locally based, locally driven, consensus driven. Uh, the local governments participate by becoming members through an interlocal agreement, uh, through a statutory uh, ability in Utah law. Um, and the local governments each pay dues to participate. <clears throat> and the elected officials make up the board. <clears throat> and then there is a 35-member stakeholder council to try to get a cross-section of of the various um, interests in the Wasatch Mountains from the private sector. Um, as I said, the, the uh, picking up on Mountain Accord and continuing with Mountain Accord, the commitment was to make decisions by consensus. And I'll say in the four years uh, the Central Wasatch Commission's been rolling, I can only think of one or two times on minor matters when there, it wasn't, there wasn't, weren't unanimous decisions uh, by the Central Wasatch Commission. Um, I'll also note that I think this is probably a unique governmental entity anywhere in the country, that there, there are parallels, something like the Tahoe Regional Planning Association dealing with the Tahoes, at, or, or, with the Sierras around the Tahoe, around Lake Tahoe. Um, there are, in the urban areas, there are metro regional decision-making groups. Um, but they have different kinds of authorities and, and powers. The Central Wasatch Commission has no jurisdictional power. Uh, by that I mean, as our chair, Chris Robinson, likes to say, uh, we are all hat, no cattle. Uh, we're, um, we've operated by uh, getting local interests together who know and understand and appreciate these mountains the best, and to try to let consensus form and to drive uh, decisions from that perspective. Um, I mentioned that we've had really um, some major challenges from my vantage point with, uh, <clears throat> with sort of lost momentum over time. Uh, in my view, the other thing that has really made it difficult um, is that, as we all know, we live in an era of hyper-partisanship, uh, hyper-grandstanding, uh, a very adversarial world, a much less civil world when it comes to decision making in government. And that's been true for a while at the federal level, I'd say. It has uh, moved down uh, in just about everywhere at the state level. And increasingly, including here in Utah, it's happening locally as well. Uh, the pandemic, I think, contributes to that because people aren't seeing each other face to face and developing those relationships that help bridge sometimes differences uh, of opinion and disagreements about policy. Uh, with that, I think there's uh, also just a dissipation of trust. Trust in government, uh, trust in anyone who appears to have uh, uh, some power or influence. Um, and all of that, I think, has made it much more difficult uh, to try to operate, at least on as grand a scale as the Central Wasatch Mountains, to operate uh, in a consensus-based way. Uh, I'm going to mention a few sort of concluding thoughts, and then I'd love to hear both people's comments and answer more uh, any questions that you have. Um, so where does this leave us uh, today? 
Um, a remarkable thing, despite my sort of noting how the world has fragmented around the, and fractured a bit around the central Wasatch Mountains, is there's one thing that still keeps everybody at the table, and that is a love and appreciation for these mountains. That is unwavering, and it cuts across all differences. Um, people realize what an unbelievable, almost unbelievable, but we believe it, uh, resource we have here that simply isn't enjoyed you know, in other places, other, or certainly other urban areas, major urban areas. Um, so now, in my mind, we sort of turn to the you know, question, are we, uh, are we going to be in a phase going forward of the paralysis, the, the decision-making gridlock that has, I think, uh, prevented uh, a lot of things that need to happen and should happen? Uh, in these mountains going forward? Um, or are we going to uh, find a way to take our, uh, our respect and desire for the qualities of these mountains to allow us to uh, at least limit the adversarial nature of our, of our interactions to a point that decisions can be made and things can happen to address uh, the challenges and really the opportunities in many ways in these mountains. Um, for me, uh, personally, I'll just say that I waver back and forth on this on probably a daily basis, uh, maybe hourly some days, depending on what's going on. Uh, and I've been living in this arena and working in this re arena continuously since the mid-1980s for all levels of government. Uh, and on all kinds of issues uh, from 1985 85 on, I don't think there's been uh, a day that's gone by that I haven't uh, done something working from different vantage points um, on matters in these mountains. Um, I'll also say this, I, th I remain optimistic. And, and the reason is because what I think about is, first of all, how much people care about these mountains. Um, and, and also, I think a realization by so many of us that if we don't get a handle locally on what we want and try to drive the ship of other decision makers, uh, those decisions are going to get made and they may get delayed and they may get changed over time, but they are going to get made by others. They're going to get made by the state. They're going to get made by the federal government who do not have the same interests who don't have the same knowledge, who don't understand uh, these mountains the way we do locally. And I think my, uh, my expectation is with an enormous amount of handholding, and all of us who've been involved in these processes know that that never ends, uh, day or night, weekday or weekend, uh, that, that we, we can and we probably will get there. But it's it's always going to have uh, some pain and suffering along the way, both in terms of decisions that are made, but also in terms of probably the way people interact with each other. So with that, um, I'm going to stop. And I certainly welcome questions, comments, thought people, thoughts people have. There are a lot of things I haven't really addressed that I would invite people's thoughts on. I know today people are particularly focused on Little Cottonwood Canyon and the Utah Department of Transportation decision that keeps getting delayed. I think we understand why um, on what to do to, to address transportation in that canyon. Uh, and I, I've intentionally not covered that, but I'm happy to talk about whatever's on people's minds. Uh, Ralph, thank you very much yeah. for that uh, presentation. You've uh, certainly uh, provided us as a background and uh, set the stage for some questions. I've got some uh, coming in remotely, but I wanted uh, initially to give those who are here in the room an opportunity to pose a question. Yes, sir. And speak up uh, as loud as you can. What are the viable options for uh, Little Cottonwood Canyon in your view? So well, uh, the question was, uh, what are the viable options for Little Cottonwood Canyon? I assume that's referring principally to the transportation issue. 
Um, well, I, just to put it in context, because not everyone may be familiar with, and I'm sure you are, that uh, as I mentioned, um, UDOT is doing an environmental impact statement for Little Cottonwood Transportation. They've completed a draft EIS. They've uh, they've narrowed it down in their uh, in their realm to two proposals. One is to basically double the width of the road, um, and the second is to uh, um, is to build a gondola up Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, and both of those options would include build, you know uh, avalanche sheds. This is Little Cottonwood Canyon is in the top of the of the roads in the world uh, for avalanche, for hazardous avalanche conditions. Um, so that's where UDOT is. Um, and maybe I'll mention where the Central Wasatch Commission is. Uh, the Central Wasatch Commission spent two years intensively, and its stakeholders, uh, analyzing um, a mountain transportation system, so looking more broadly than just Little Cottonwood Canyon for these mountains and arrived after two years uh, uh, where they could not agree on a mode, okay? So whether it's, there really are three modes. These haven't changed, I can tell you, for 30 plus years, unless you think a dirigible might work. Um, it's either bus, rail, or aerial. Um, those are the ways we can get around um, in this area, or, or have the potential to get around in this area. Um, the Central Wasatch Commission couldn't come to an agreement themselves. And in fact, I will tell you, UDOT points to that and says, if you guys can't come to agreement, then why do you expect us to form some sort of agreement anyone's going to like, um, or a decision anyone's going to like? Um, but what they said was, look, we can't agree on the mode, but we can agree on some things that need to happen in any decision for transportation solutions. And there are five of them. I'm not going to necessarily be able to give you all up right off the top of my head. But you've got to look at broader than just Little Cottonwood Canyon. It's tied to a transportation system in the region. Uh, you've got to look especially carefully at the watershed impacts, not just in the road corridor, but beyond. Uh, you've got to look at what happens in terms of increasing the number of visitors that are coming into these mountains and what those impacts are. Um, and you've got to look at the kind of interconnected nature uh, and year-round nature of the use of these mountains. UDOT's focus is on doing one thing, reducing traffic congestion on the Little Cottonwood Canyon by 30% looking out to the year 2050. Uh, and that view is skewed from the point of view that I think everyone locally seemed to be able to agree to around the table, at least the local elected officials. In terms of the, uh, the solutions, um, there aren't any solutions without impacts. That is just a reality uh, to be able to get more people up and down this canyon to be able to get the number of people we have today up and down these canyons. Um, we're going to need to find another solution. The most popular notion that I hear out there and appreciate, because I, I wish it would work, is to, just, is to throw more buses at it. And people point to Zion as an example where a bus shuttle system has been used successfully until quite recently. I mentioned the amount of visitation we get in these mountains. It is extraordinary. If we were to develop a bus system unimpeded to serve Little Cottonwood Canyon, you'd need a bus going up and down this canyon every two and a half minutes. And that doesn't even get you to what a lot of us would love to see, which is the removal of cars altogether on the road. That's to get to about a 50% reduction of cars on the road. We have so many people going up and down and accessing these canyons today and invariably will increase in terms of pressures going forward. Uh, there is not a transportation expert out there that I have ever heard or seen, including UTA, which is our best transportation expert here locally, that will tell you that buses can work. And that if we were to build a bus system to get to that, th those headways, which by the way, you can't load and unload a bus with ski equipment in two minutes. Um, 
uh, you would have to build an enormous amount of infrastructure. The costs, despite what would be great, are not less than a gondola. Or depending on, on who you talk to, the third option that you took off the table, which is a train as an option. Um, so, you know, buses are really desirable, they're convenient, they're accessible. Let me ask you in this room, how many of you on a, any sort of regular basis, and I'd ask you online, but I can't see you online, use the bus as a way to access your skiing in the winter or to get up in the mountains in the winter? Okay, one of you. I do it, and a couple of you. Uh, that's probably about the percentage, okay? It's probably about 20% of the people use the bus. I use it regularly. I will tell you, and I'd be interested in your views if they're different, as someone who regularly uses the bus, it does not work very well. Even with it now being improved service on 15 minute increments now throughout the day, they take a little bit of a break on that, on those headways, on that frequency during the middle of the day. Buses get caught in the same winter conditions as all the cars. I've had to wait an hour for a bus that was on a 15 minute increment. Because what happens is you start getting the conditions change, whether it's because of drivers or because of snow conditions or some combination. And the buses get clogged up in that same traffic. And so no matter how well you try to create a regular bus service, it doesn't function that way. Even, I mean, I, that even happens on days when there's, you know, when there isn't weather to contend with. Uh, I don't know, maybe your experiences have been, I love taking the bus and I'll continue to do it, but it, you think about trying to reduce the number of people on that road with buses. I mean, I don't think I've ever been on those buses when it wasn't full. Um, and if you wanna, and now we take about 10% of the trips on buses. Uh, if we're gonna reduce congestion, you've gotta up that dramatically uh, in terms of the number of buses you put on. So anyway, I, I guess my short answer is, I would love it if buses would work. I know how popular it is. It's the easiest solution. But it's not a real solution if we're gonna provide for people, which brings sort of the other side of the equation. It's like, well, do you just start limiting use? Uh, well, the Forest Service isn't willing to do that at this point and doesn't show any inclination to do that on forest lands, which a lot of these lands are, and they tend to manage the recreation resource. The ski areas sure aren't interested in doing that, although they're talking about, which would be great, a reservation system at some of the resorts. They want to keep expanding their user base. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, people talk about the Utah way. I, I don't know that that's the Utah way, you know, regardless of how desirable it might be. So, you know, we're seeing that happen in national parks. There are a lot of things going on around the rest of the country around visitor use. And we're actually doing a visitor use study right now, the Central Wasatch Commission, that we hope will inform management decisions going forward because there really hasn't been something that is um, detailed enough or accurate enough to really help make decisions. So we'll see. I, I'd welcome other views there, but yeah. Sure. See if I can interpret what you said. Buses aren't viable, so the only thing that you mentioned that would be viable is a gondola. Correct? Well, I will tell you, I'm speaking solely for myself here. I find the idea of a gondola in Little Cottonwood Canyon an abomination. Uh, visually, I mean, we're talking 200 plus foot towers and cars, not just cars, but lit cars and lighting for cars to protect. You know, when you're at those heights, you have to do it for aerial, you know, helicopters and flying up and down the canyon. You've got to light the whole system. Uh, I just, I think it's in a, such a beautiful canyon, you'd ruin it. Uh, my own view is that uh, the, the actual best solution, and we recommended this as staff to our board, but they didn't like it, and I understand it, uh, would be to tie into the existing rail system and have a rail system. There was rail running up and down Little Cottonwood Canyon from 1880 into the early 1900s. Uh, they built an avalanche shed all the way up and down that canyon. They did a terrible job. It only lasted one year. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, it, there's a railroad bed. You know the trail that goes up Little Cottonwood Canyon? It's still there. Uh, that's the old railroad bed. Um, 
it takes up less space, it has less environmental impact, and it has the capacity. The problem with buses is a capacity issue and cost, really, when you get to the numbers we're talking about. Um, plus, you'd have to double the size of the road if you kept cars on the road to be able to provide for car use as well. Um, trains have a permeable surface. Um, you, can run, you could run them in the right-of-way where the road is, or you could run them in the old right-of-way and tie in further up. Um, there are issues with trains, too. Um, you can avoid a lot of the avalanches with trains, depending on the, on the routing that was picked. Uh, and any of you who have been to Switzerland and been in other parts of the world, it's like, it is so slick. And um, I'll just give an example of how trains can also reduce vehicular traffic and encourage uh, transit use. When the university line was put in here, it reduced vehicular traffic to the university by 40%, okay? Buses had been going up here all along, but there's an attraction for people at a comfort level for people with trains that doesn't exist with other transit modes, certainly with buses. Um, so that's my own view, uh, but I also know that people have really strongly held views on every possibility, so. You've got another question. Is our understanding of the capacity of the canyons have in our decision making, and, and can we can we move forward without really having a full understanding? That's uh, a really good question. So the question um, for those of you who couldn't hear it online uh, had to do with the um, dealing with the capacity issue, the the user issue, user capacity issue. We used to call it carrying capacity, but for some reason that's a kind of a word out of fashion now. Uh, issue in the in the mountains. Um, that has to be done in parallel with any decision that's made on transportation. Um, they're not independent um, because you want to have a system that serves either the need or what you define as a reasonable capacity. Uh, the Forest Service view is that they don't have any problem with capacity. They don't foresee any problem with capacity. It's just a matter of infrastructure, or more toilets and better trailheads and and that sort of thing. I think uh, we're doing a very intensive study right now that looks at the physical impacts of all of the uses in all of the you know all of the pinpointed locations throughout the canyons, um, and this, it will give us a lot of really good information. Uh, the the physical and environmental impacts, while most important, are in some ways the easiest to address. I mean, you can mitigate uh, a lot of users right by what you do in engineering and, and uh, buffering around streams and water waterways and uh, how you build your trails and other uses to minimize erosion and the impacts. Uh, the harder part is to try to preserve the range of experiences that we so enjoy in these mountains. Um, you can get a true wilderness experience in these mountains, and I'm not going to tell you where because I like it. Um, but you can, you can still do that here. Uh, but if we're gonna, pres it's, it's, it's uh, harder and harder over time, I will say, for those of us who really enjoy that kind of experience. Uh, and the pandemic has only enhanced the pressures and the numbers of people going up and it, it's sort of a sign of things to come. Um, so um, I, I think my own view, I'm speaking just personally here, is is we've got to get a handle on what levels of use in what places are acceptable and how do we manage the numbers of people going in these canyons. We're not doing it today. Um, and some people don't want to do it. And I think that's fine. But if it's important to preserve wilderness qualities, you know, which includes solitude, um, you know, we don't even work, we don't even have permits if people want to go backpacking in these mountains, right? Um, it's, uh, at some point, we're going to have to address it. And in my mind, the visitor use question you're raising, uh, we need to get a handle on and should be doing it at least in conjunction with, if not as part of transportation decisions. Um, I don't think you could comment on the conservation plan that the CWC had mm -hmm 
it's been a great deal of effort, um, promote, you know, crafting and promoting. Um, you, you know, can you speak to its importance and, and what what got in the way of getting it, you know, pushed forward? So, so the conservation plans, it was, the question was about the conservation plan of Mountain, that came out of Mountain Accord, right? And that the CWC has worked on uh, nonstop from the time I came on. We actually have federal legislation from a local level drafted. The words on paper that's gone through four drafts is in a fifth, uh, just refining it and refining it based on public involvement, public comment. The question is kind of what's kept it from happening. And it's a fairly straightforward answer. Our congressional delegation doesn't want to take it up. Um, and I understand the politics for them. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. I mean, here we have uh, not universal, not un unanimous support for a piece of legislation locally. Uh, but acceptance at a minimum and support in many quarters for that legislation. And we have a mantra about let's support what locals want. Well, there's never been a bill as well hand delivered to our congressional delegation as this bill. But the ideology today, uh, the partisanship today, uh, I, and this is my view, uh, keeps it from being introduced and moved. Now, there are other reasons, um, and I will say there's a legitimacy to at least one reason that's given. I mentioned that in, in Mountain Accord, there was sort of this barbell, right? We're going to solve transportation. We're going to solve better lands and resource protection. Well, the lands bill, we moved on very quickly. By the end of 2019, we had a bill not just the Chaffetz bill, but refining the Chaffetz bill based on public input and looking at all the issues that, you know, that we could identify. Um, trans that we weren't there with transportation. The transportation work didn't really start until late 2019, early 2020 by the CWC. UDOT had been working on its EIS, but pretty slow moving process. Um, and so folks, uh, have said, look, we don't want to pass a, a lands bill in Congress because then we won't have the leverage to get the transportation solutions that not everybody's going to like. And so this sort of tug of war or um, uh, hanging of uh, <clears throat> you know, one issue on another, um, I think has, has also contributed to it. Uh, I, my own view is that the transportation issues are going to work in a parallel universe anyway. They're mostly state and local decisions, and the lands decisions are mostly federal decisions. And, um, and so we just need to be working on both. <clears throat> um, and you're never going to be able to time one contingent on the timing of another because they're in different forms, venues. Uh, just to put a finer point, uh, Ralph, on your uh, last uh, answer to the question, is uh, the designation of wilderness uh, principle hold up on the uh, lands uh, bill portion of the uh, Central Wasatch uh, uh, solutions? Um, yes and no. Um, it, it is in some circles. I mean, we have at least one member of our congressional delegation that you can't even say the W word in front of. And that uh, legislator, Senator Lee, is in a very powerful position. He's the ranking member on the Senate Natural Resources Committee. This bill goes through natural resources. And he's obviously a you know, prominent member of our delegation. Um, <clears throat> but I, I would also say that um, it's, a, it's broader than that. I mean, the, the bigger, there, there are two other designations in the bill. One of them is to create a new, a, we call it a conservation recreation area because people couldn't agree on the name. But those of you who know the terminology, it would be a conservation or recreation area in terms of its general um, uh, category <clears throat> um, that would cover all of the federal lands. Uh, there's some exceptions. But for the most part, would cover all of the federal lands um, in this part of the Wasatch. Uh, the one other designation involves white pine, uh, which is kind of in a unique circumstance because there's existing motorized use, there's helicopter skiing, there's access 
to the dam that's up there um, with motor vehicles. Um, you could always, I guess, cherry stem that road, you know, as we know in the wilderness world. But uh, but there's an existing helicopter permit in the area there. So so there's a, a a proposal for a watershed protection area, which really is wilderness absent, uh, the motorized use uh, piece of it, and uh, that would occur as well. But. You know, and there's, I'd say over time, there are people, and, and I'm going to include the ski areas in there because we just got comments from them in some recent um, interaction with them. They're going, well, we, you know, the land exchanges piece uh, didn't work, and I won't get into the reasons for that, but it, the, the land exchange pieces of it didn't work. But they're not saying, you know, I don't know if we want to get part of the, of the legislation would have hemmed in the ski resorts. It would have created permanent boundaries they could not expand beyond. And now they're saying, well, we don't know if we want to get hemmed in. Uh, the one exception has been Alta. They were part of Mountain Accord originally, and a deal got kind of worked out around Grizzly Gulch and with the change in players there, the management there. Uh, they've decided to, pu to pull out of, uh, of their deal around Grizzly Gulch and, uh, and creating a, you know, more federal protection in that area. But, um, it's a, you know, the, the time element doesn't help on things like this. And, um, you know, the ownership of these ski resorts has changed a lot. They're now um, uh, just about all, they're all corporate, really, in their mentality and, and approach to things. And so that sort of strong local connection um, has diminished over time and invariably probably will continue to diminish. Randy Doyle, who's been there from the founding of Brighton, his family, uh, he's retiring this month. Um, and who knows who will come in next on behalf of the corporate entity that owns, you know, that owns Brighton. Thank you for that edification. Uh, you've got a couple questions uh, from online uh, regarding the uh, uh, recent uh, proposals that have uh, been uh, talked about in the uh, uh, paper about the uh, uh, proposed uh, gravel uh, operation in Parley's Canyon. Uh, and uh, uh, one of uh, our uh, participants frames it as, uh, what are your thoughts regarding the recent uh, uh, Salt Lake uh, County Council's decision to amend the county's zoning ordinances to prohibit uh, mining operation uh, in uh, forestry recreation zones and foothill and canyon overlay zones uh, in uh, our uh, Wasatch Mountains. Well, I uh, I just wish it had happened 20 years ago when I was actually working on a sensitive lands ordinance for Salt Lake County. We thought mining was done in the mountains, and we didn't pay much attention to it when we developed that ordinance. Our firm did with Salt Lake County or for Salt Lake County. Uh, it was. I mean, it's a decision to be applauded. It's going to be a big fight. A lot of that decision making is at the state level with Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, and the state statutes tend to favor uh, <coughs> sand and gravel operations and mining um, in decision making. Uh, so I think it's going to be a long, drawn out fight. The Central Wasatch Commission came out with a, so as a group of all of the local officials, came out as a group supporting Salt Lake County's decision and opposing that. Uh, mine development as well. Um, yeah, I remember when the other one came into Parley's, and I was going, "What are we doing here?" You know, uh, and it's been fought. Save Our Canyons took on that first one on the other side of the, you know, on the north side of I eighty, unsuccessfully because they just didn't have uh, the legal basis at that time. And I guess it would have been nice if there had been forethought to, you know, to try to change the county's ordinance and, for that matter, the state policies to make that more difficult. Uh, another question that uh, you have is uh, uh, noting that there's a, not only the NEPA process uh, ongoing uh, in uh, Cotton, Little Cottonwood Canyon on transportation, but the Forest Service is doing a separate process for Mill Creek, uh, and uh, likely Big Cottonwood uh, is next. Uh, and the question really is, uh, should we perhaps be doing a comprehensive analysis for transportation in the various uh, canyons? Yeah, that's a, a really good point. We, we should be. I mean, uh, the, 
the network of use and, uh, and transportation solutions ties all of these canyons together. Uh, Mill Creek is kind of unique in some respects. It doesn't, you know, it's a dead end canyon. Um, and what the person is referring to is, um, one of the things in Mount Nakor was it, it recommended that there be a shuttle system put in place for Mill Creek Canyon. Um, this uh, is called a FLAP grant, uh, those of you who know the terminology. That's a federal grant that Salt Lake County is leading, uh, is looking at um, what to do with that road. And the Forest Service is insistent, not wrongfully, that it's like we can't handle a shuttle system until we know, you know the turnarounds and the parking and how a shuttle system would work and the trailheads are improved you know, as well. And so this FLAP grant is intended to um, help with that in Mill Creek. And it may take, um, it's only one step along the way, unfortunately. Um, in Big Cottonwood Canyon, uh, some of you may know, there was a funding request that looked like there was going to be an appropriation to do an environmental impact statement on transportation for Big Cottonwood Canyon. That funding got pulled at the very end of the legislature. Um, the Central Wasatch Commission is now trying to get out in front of it a little bit and get all of the players together around their specific interests in Big Cottonwood Canyon to try to help shape the scope and direction of that EIS um, so that it would hopefully, you know, with along with the question, not be quite as narrowly driven to the roadway and a highway-based solution. I mean, invariably, the highway is going to be involved, but to consider the other factors and how it connects with the rest of the, of the transportation system in the valley and beyond. Uh, another question as, uh, notes that uh, a lot of the transportation discussion is focused on uh, getting people up and down to the ski areas. Uh, what about uh, hikers and uh, others uh, like that uh, uh, who aren't uh, participants in uh, downhill skiing? Yeah. Um, what has been happening increasingly, and we've seen this explode during the pandemic, is the heaviest use times are no longer just in the winter. They are increasingly year round. And the heavier, heaviest use days in 2020 uh, were in October, in both Big and Little Cottonwood Canyons. Now, Oktoberfest probably has something to do with it, but that doesn't explain Big Cottonwood Canyon. Um, and the canyons all have different sort of characteristics, both physically and in terms of users. But uh, it is one of the challenges, I think, in the way UDOT is looking at this EIS. They're only looking at solving the peak use time, which they define as the winter ski season time. Uh, I mean, the ski areas are the biggest draw destination for folks. They are not looking in any of their solutions at any stops other than the ski areas from the mouth of the canyon. Uh, there's some NEPA reasons for doing that that I get, uh, even though it's wrong-minded. Um, uh, but you start in providing for more capacity in these canyons, it just means that many more people. And they're not, they're not even looking at that other than at the ski area. So, I mean, it's a really good point that the person is raising. And uh, that's part of, it's one of the things the CWC came up in its, quote, pillars document for transportation was you have to look at year-round use and you've got to look at the range of users. Um, and it's pretty hard to develop a transportation system when you're leaving out, you know, increasingly the majority of people who are using these mountains. Uh, you've got a question from someone who recognized your uh, interesting background, uh, asked you to speak about uh, the need for both a planning and legal background in the type of work you're doing uh, and where you see the intersection between the two. <clears throat> Um, when I was a young person and looking at a career, um, I thought I was going to make a career in the National Park Service where I was working seasonally down at the Grand Canyon. And, uh, and I thought, well, um, this college stuff seems kind of boring and not, not, not getting me anywhere in terms of learning, uh, learning things that lead to a career. And I concluded for myself, this was, um, 1971, um, that the best education I could get 
for what I wanted to do was a combination of law and planning. I didn't ever intend to practice, and I never have in any meaningful way, ever, never intended to practice law. I just thought it would be a good education. And I thought planning um, represented the potential for a great knowledge and way to sort of look at the world and processes for decision making. And so that's, for me, is sort of what I chose. I think there are a lot of different routes people can go that work for them and that would work in their careers. And I've been happy that I made the choices I did. So another uh, uh, question uh, relates back to uh, transportation, and that uh, is uh, what about uh, simpler uh, cheaper uh, visitor use management solutions, such as uh, parking reservations at the <coughs> ski areas, which seem to uh, limit uh, the congestion uh, in Little Cottonwood Canyon last year. Is that an option? Yeah, I think that can help. Uh, it really can. I mean, we, we did see, I think, a benefit, uh, at least on some days, in Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, by having a reservation for system. And we've seen it work well for the resorts and I think work well for the users. I think there's some challenges associated with it. But I, um, it's a, maybe a nice short term uh, break in the issues that we have. Um, but, uh, and so, because it helps people from thinking they can go up in the canyons and find parking when there may not be any parking. Um, so I think it can help. I think it's one of several kind of short-term things that can really make a difference. Tolling can make a difference. Um, I think, you know, continuing to improve. There have been some pretty significant improvements over the last few years, but continuing to improve the bus service. Uh, continuing to provide in incentives for people to take the bus. So one of the things we started this year, and we'll, we'll continue, that CWC has been working with UTA and the local governments off, uh, is when you have the congestion at the mouth of the canyons, you actually have a bus bypass service where the law enforcement folks basically bring the buses around the congestion uh, so that they move faster than vehicular automobile traffic. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done. I think that can help. Uh, I just, in all of the analysis that has been done and that I've looked at, it's not a long-term solution. Uh, maybe it goes with something like saying, okay, we're gonna limit numbers of users. The ski areas aren't, don't wanna do that. Uh, they just wanna be able to control um, not the numbers at their resorts, uh, which they've, you know, Alta and Deer Valley used to do a little bit of that, they don't anymore. Um, uh, they want to keep expanding their numbers. Um, so it doesn't solve the volume of people that we have going up and down these mountains long term. But there are a lot of little things we can do that can help short term. Speaking of the long term, uh, you've got another question uh, that uh, brings uh, climate change into the discussion, uh, asking uh, is, that, is climate change being considered uh, in these major management decisions and investments? Uh, that are related to them, uh, if uh, climate change drastically reduces uh, the length and quality of the ski seasons, uh, what does that mean uh, for the desirability and the financial viability of a gondola or some of these other uh, solutions? I mean, obviously, that's the, the big one in the room, broad, broadly speaking, and, and has a really big impact in these mountains. Um, I was actually just in a session this week, Salt Lake City's developing its third watershed management plan and for the first time is really looking at climate change and there was a multi-hour session this week on how climate change is affecting these mountains that was really well done um, and I assume you could get that through Salt Lake City uh, if, if you wanted to look at it. Um, there's no question that the whole snow uh, conditions are, have changed and are changing and will increasingly change. And it's going to affect skiing and it starts at the lower elevations and moves up. It affects our water supply and affects all kinds of environmental conditions and even and human use conditions. Um, there's no question that in my mind that contributes to what sort of a solution do you develop for transportation in these mountains, for example, when 50 years from now, there's a decent chance we're not going to have 
resort skiing the way we do today, if at all, and sooner probably. Um, unless by some miracle that no one expects, uh, or some people might, but you know, something really changes dramatically. Um, so uh, it, the climate change is an enormous issue for us locally in a lot of ways, including for the ski resorts and what sort of solutions for transportation we should be expecting. You know, some of the ski resorts, um, in Park City was on, in the Cummings family. I remember talking to Ian Cummings about this back in the early teens of this, you know, of this, de of this century. Um, Park City was already planning for it. They were looking at a time when Park City wasn't going to have much skiing, if at all. And the development we see at the old Gargosa area, what's it called, Wood, Woodhead or Wood? That development as you're coming down Parley's on that side of the mountain. Uh, that was something that the Cummings family, and Ian Cummings particularly, was looking at back then going, you know what, in the future, we may not have skiing at Park City in the way we're thinking of it, so maybe we develop a play park for snow play uh, where we don't have to be, you know, trying to create snow for a whole mountain. Um, so it's, it's all changing, um, and I'm sure we don't even understand at this point, although we do increasingly understand what the impacts are, and, and we need to make decisions. The, the infrastructure decisions aren't for a year. They're decades and decades of, of investment, and uh, we should be factoring that in. Uh, and I will tell you, the Central Wasatch Commission, we did look at that pretty carefully in our mountain transportation system study, including looking at what modes, uh, uh, what the carbon impacts are of the different modes. Buses were by far the worst of the transit modes in terms of carbon impacts. Um, and we can understand why. Uh, numbers of vehicles, at this time at least, the, the way you power those vehicles. Um, and, but even if you switch to electrify, just the number of vehicles and the and the amount of consumption there. Um, and then uh, trains and gondolas uh, were both about even trains a little bit better than gondolas in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, one final question, uh, noting the, uh, as you have, uh, the expanded uh, use uh, both of the, uh, of the mountains uh, and the uh, foothills. Uh, any thoughts on how to educate people about their uh, conservation uh, and usage responsibilities? That's uh, a good question. Um, I'll say when, uh, when I and my firm did the Salt Lake City watershed plans, management plans, in the second plan we did, the 99 plan, uh, we made education one of the highest priorities, the Keep It Pure program and all of those things, you, those of us who see around uh, trying to protect the watershed was an effort to improve uh, education among folks. We are increasingly, as we urbanize, divorced more from our environment and understanding what the environment does on a day-to-day -day basis. Education's gotta always be at the key. And I mean, we've seen, those of us who get out during the pandemic, that we've got a whole flood of new users who do not understand conservation and basic etiquette in the outdoors. And, um, it's just going to have to be an increasing effort uh, to try to educate folks. Uh, and we, we want to encourage people to get outdoors, uh, but it's astounding sometimes to see how people treat it beyond just littering. Yeah. As one of our uh, online uh, participants said uh, in his uh, note, uh, well said, Ralph. And Thanks. thank you very much for taking the time to enlighten us on uh, these central Wasatch uh, Mountain issues. Thank, thank you. Thanks for including me in this. And thank everyone for joining us.